Hi, and welcome to another episode of Switchcast, a podcast delving into the world of film brought to you by the team at Switch. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Charlie David Page. I'm Jess Fenton. I'm Daniel Lamon. And I'm Chris Edwards. It's Thursday the 22nd of February 2018. On this week's show, the BAFTA Awards have been announced. We run through the winners out of this year's eclectic nominees. We take a look at the Oscar misses that confirmed we were in the bad place <laughs> as we discuss our favourite films without a single nomination to their name. And I ask if our pure imagination is ready for a third incarnation of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory with production of a new film just announced. And as always, all our reviews and giveaways. Let's get straight into it with Game Night. Guess who's in it? Well, if you don't have a clue, Jason Bateman, Rachel McAdams, Michael C. Hall, and Jesse Plemons, just to name a few from this amusing operation. Daniel scrabbled, I mean, scrambled to the cinema to take in this comedic mousetrap. So will this film connect four and have the monopoly on the box office? Yes. Annie and Max, played by Rachel McAdams and Jason Bateman, love games, so much so that they fell in love over their shared competitive personalities. Every week they host a game night with some friends, but when Max's brother Brooks is invited, played by Carl Chandler, Brooks decides to take it up a notch with a murder mystery game. So when Brooks is suddenly kidnapped, everyone assumes it's part of the game. But is it? You're not gonna know what's real and what's fake. <laughs> Is this gun real? Oh, oh no, Andy. Oh, oh no, 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 bang, no. Bang. Ah! Ow. Oh my god, I shot you! What the f I always enjoy the camaraderie of good friends. It's often we don't appreciate what we have until it's gone. Oh, because your wife left you. Oh, shit. I have one idea, it's so crazy, it just might work. You're gonna crash the car into the plane like Liam Neeson in Taken 3? He did that in Taken 3, huh? Oh, uh, you missed it. <laughs> Thanks, baby. I hate game night! Stop! Wait, wait, I have kids at home. Not with an ass like that, you don't. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> With a killer premise, a cracking screenplay, and inventive direction, Game Night is a total surprise, a rollicking comedy caper that delivers in spades. Like a slapstick comedy reimagining of David Finch's The Game, it's a puzzle box that keeps unfolding itself with hilarious results, bolstered by great performances taking advantage of fully rounded and realised characters. The cinematography is wildly imaginative, and the editing is snappy as hell, with directors John Francis Daly and Jonathan Goldstein finding every possible way to push what you can do within the mould of a Hollywood comedy. The ensemble cast really bring it home, with Jason Bateman having more fun than he's had in years, and Rachel McAdams revelling in the comedy playground she's finally allowed to play in. And at an hour and 45 minutes, it never overstays its welcome, moving at a cracking pace and not wasting a minute. I had an absolute ball with this film, screaming with laughter at every turn and reveling in its inventiveness and playfulness. Game Night is the first great surprise of 2018 and one of the best Hollywood comedies in years. Four stars. Yes, Rachel McAdams, triumphant return to comedy. Who's with me? It's been a while. When was the last time she did a comedy? Like a proper full on, not like romantic comedy comedy. Okay, so Wedding Crashes was probably the last time she did a proper comedy, but she played the straight person in it. Like she was not the comedic person. She was not there for laughs. I reckon the last time was truly like Mean Girls. <laughs> fucking straight people. I know fucking straight people. <laughs> You know, lately she's been making things like True Detective and Spotlight and South Doctor Poor Strange and um, About Time and The Vow and Sherlock Holmes and like she was. I don't like, know you guys. Aloha was a laugh of- riot. <laughs> yes, because everyone fell in love with her because of Mean Girls and the Hot Chicken stuff, and these were comedies, and she was great in them. I'm so excited to see her back in a comedy. She does usually tend to exert some level of comic skill in the films. Like she was for me one of the highlight performances in the Sherlock Holmes films. I always oh, just they're loved they're her. On sc- in those films, the, mm. amount of, the amount of snap that she has. Yeah. Um, oh God, there's a pair of films I haven't thought about in a very long time. I don't oh, think they require be. much to think about with them, really. You may fear the fact that there is another one on the horizon, oh, but anyway, no. I don't fear that fact. I liked those movies. Yeah, I really enjoy oh. them. I the really liked was the enjoyable. The second one was like a complete travesty. Was also enjoyable. No. <laughs> no. 
I really enjoyed it. Hashtag justice for Numi. Anyway, yes, this has got got a good this has got yeah, a great I'm excited cast. and scared. Yes, it does. It's like sex with Daniel. I'm excited and scared. <laughs> I don't understand that, that statement <laughs> at all. Anyway. Guys. Just pour yourself another one, Chris. I should. No more gin for Chris. He calls it his podcast juice. <laughs> 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 it's like Brent. It's like an evil Brent. Thank you so much. <laughs> Oh you can find my full review at makethetheswitch.com.au and Game Night is in cinemas now. Also about today is Finding Your Feet. Jess went to check out this British comedy, so did you have a toe-tapping time? I can usually rely on the Brits to show me a good time at the cinema, but this one was a little, how should I put this, on the depressing side for a comedy? Please allow me to explain. Sandra, Imelda Staunton, yay, is blissfully planning her husband's retirement and the new life that comes with it when the bomb drops. He's having an affair with her best friend. Exiled, Sandra seeks shelter and a shoulder from her estranged bohemian sister, Biff, Celia Imry. You know, Auntie Una from the Bridget Jones Diary movies. With nothing better to do and her previous life in ruins, Sandra reluctantly joins Biff at her weekly dance class, meeting new friends, new interests, and possibly new love. What are you doing here? Might have been having an affair. Charlie, this is my little sister Sandra. Nice to meet you. Lady Abbott. Lady Abbott? Maybe this is an opportunity for you to get to know one another again. I look so happy. You are. This could be the best thing that ever happened to you. I've loved Mike for most of my life, and whatever he's done, those feelings don't just go away. Why don't you come to my dance class? It might cheer you up. How did your internet date go at the weekend? Well, let's just say I got more than I bargained for. Oh, lucky you. No, he showed up with his wife in tow. Turns out I'd clicked swinging instead of swimming on my list of likes. <laughs> like you, Biff. I can't just open up like a lotus flower. Come on, give it a go. You just need to take a leap of faith. We've been talent spotted. We're going to Rome, city of lovers. Into the future. I know you will be Thank you. Well, I'm at the view. Oh, the cast, the premise, such fun, such fun. No. Everyone in this film is either dead, dying, or affected by death or the dying. This is not the dry, humid, laugh a minute I was promised. This is a film about aging and the nature of changing relationships as time moves on. In saying that, it was written by one first timer and the guy that wrote Centrinians, both of whom are in their 40s, and if I'm reading into this correctly, believe that all we have to look forward to in our 60s is adultery, dementia, and our good friend death g sign me up look the acting is not to fault here the cast nor the plot it's just been handled badly heavy-handedly and gosh all i wanted was a good laugh and they stumbled finding your feet gets two and a half stars yeah jess this is really disappointing uh, to hear yeah. like i had such high hopes for this because as you say the cast is awesome yep. joanna lumley in anything i will pretty much watch mm-hmm. so that's number one but the trailer made it look so so lovely yep. and and just like a whole bunch of fun it definitely looked to be more in the realm of exotic marigold hotel yep. or um i don't know what's another quirky british comedy the second like, best exotic marigold hotel no. <laughs> <laughs> True to a lesser degree. But, but maybe there's a bit of truth in this. I mean, if, I, if I'm to look at both of my grandparents, one of them committed adultery and the other one ended up dead. So it's like, you know. Wow. <laughs> this is. This, wow. This is. Yeah. This yeah. podcast is yeah. a real corker. <laughs> Here we go. Um, Charlie's not even the one having gin. <laughs> no. Uh, Charlie, are you stealing my gin? All I have is the natural confectionery company to help me. <laughs> the thing is, all of these characters in this film are like supposed to be in their 60s. The, in today's day and age, 60 is not old. No, no, it really is People are isn't. still working in their 60s or they're just, like, just retiring. And then you watch this movie and everyone is fucking falling off the perch. And you're like, what the crap is going on? 
and it's all like sad but not sad because all these people are dying so it should be sad but the way the film handles it they keep dropping off all these characters that we've already just been introduced to or don't care about so you're like oh okay that person is now six feet under moving on so do you think it's so it's definitely the way the material is handled as opposed to the material itself that doesn't work it's a little bit of both okay Everything was just really quick and sudden. Like they just it, the whole movie just kind of goes bang, 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 bang. Like person dead, person dying, person dead, person dying, person dead, person dying, person being upset because this person died, and now we're moving on to the next thing. And you're just like, can I just breathe for a second and just have a good time in between all these casualties? But Jess, is there at least one big musical number at the end where we get, you know, some sort of enjoyment? Yeah, Please no. Please tell me. There that's, is. That's, okay, no. Okay, so in the film, they go to dance class and they end up being talent spotted and going to, I think it's the Biennale in Rome or something like that, and they perform. So, yes, there is a, there is a dance number in it. But, again, yeah, it's fine. Death comes for us all, Barbara. (laughs) (laughs) Any light that 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 this big dance scene shines on the film, hashtag spoiler alert, is quickly undone by more death and dying. So it's just (laughs) Does someone die as the result of the dance number? I don't know. This sounds like my sort of film. I'm kind of into it. It sounds like something I've written. <laughs> Dance number, and then everyone feels like shit. <laughs> One play to me. And then everyone just. <laughs> There you go. So if you like death, dying and dancing, the three magical Ds, <laughs> Finding Your Feet is in cinemas now and check out my full review at maketheswitch.com.au. I'm not sure that's one of the magical Ds, but anyway. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Also out today is A Fantastic Woman. Daniel took in this Oscar-nominated film, so can we add this to our recent collection of fantastic LGBTIQ plus films? When her older lover passes away suddenly, young trans woman Marina, played by Daniela Vega, faces the seemingly insurmountable challenge of not only dealing with her own grief, but navigating around the bigotry of her lover's family, as well as the legal hurdles placed in her way in being acknowledged as his consenting, loving partner. In the wake of the extraordinary LGBTIQ plus films released in 2017, A Fantastic Woman is yet another groundbreaking and breathtaking work of queer cinema, whose emotional and artistic impact are considerable. Chilean director Sebastian Lelio follows up his acclaimed 2013 film Gloria with another astute, uncompromising and highly imaginative character study, a portrait of a woman caught in extraordinary personal circumstances. Marina is the pulsing heart of the film, all the more so thanks to the flat-out extraordinary performance from Vega, herself a trans woman. It's an incredibly brave performance, but this has nothing to do with her being trans. This is an emotionally open, vulnerable and furious performance, the tone of which permeates through every frame of the film. Not one about a victim or any kind of other, but a survivor determined to carve her place in the world, whether the world wants her or not. There's a magical quality to a fantastic woman, a refusal to comply to the tired tropes of queer cinema to wallow in tragedy. It may be at times devastating, upsetting, and unrelenting, but more than anything, a fantastic woman is a portrait of exactly that. A powerful trans female protagonist, played by a trans female actor, giving one of the best performances of the year. Furious, playful, and gorgeous, a fantastic woman is another instant queer landmark. Four stars. I completely agree. This movie is so wonderful and she is incredible. And just the way she is centered in this film. There's no point where as a performance, and this is, again, this has nothing to do with her as a trans woman, but her as as someone going through a state of incredible grief. And no point does the performance or the film ask you to pity her. It asks you to back her, to back her need and her drive to get acknowledgement when she's not getting it. Yeah, and that's some of the most interesting stuff in the film because it feels like the director and the audience are being put into this position where we want it to become this indignant revenge thriller or revenge tale where she gets her comeuppance on these awful people doing horrific hate crimes against her. But Mm. the character is so kind and so much more interesting than that and takes the reins and with Daniela Vega and 
the character, this wonderful sort of upending of those tropes and the focus stays on her rather than on these like vengeful actions that she could have taken or that we want her to take. It's much more interesting and complicated and knotty than that. Mm. Daniel, you also mentioned in your review, which I really enjoyed reading, the fact that it's another uplifting drama for this genre and more importantly, the fact that it has these magical elements. Can you maybe tell us a little bit more about that side of things? Yeah, it has a very strange quality to it, which makes a lot of sense because magic realism as a concept mainly kind of at at its most perfect birth comes from Spanish storytelling. Even though nothing fantastical necessarily happens in the film, it has a very imaginative approach to its storytelling. And every moment where you think that it's going to go into the dark and the heavy, and there are moments in it that are actually quite grueling Mm. and very difficult to watch, but it does it with this snap that every so often it just kind of dips into her internal headspace and you're allowed to see the world a little bit more from Arena's perspective and a bit more from the way that she's mentally dealing with things. It's a fantastical film without having anything fantastical in it. It's full of magic realism without any magic realism. The approach that he has, that Lilio has to telling the story, is very similar to the kind of camp verbosity that he had in Gloria and also that would have, you know, in a really great Almodovar film or a Xavier Dolan film. The thing I could equate it to the most were the moments of cinematic spectacle that happened in Mummy, Xavier Dolan's Mummy. Moments where you become very aware of the film is taking advantage of the fact that it is a film and it can Mm. bend reality to a certain extent. And I think it's so wonderful the way that it's all entirely tied into how it's a tale of grief of someone yeah. forging their way through the grieving process. And it's so intimate the way that it does it, because as you said, it's taking you inside her mind and inside her thinking process and how she's dealing with all of these varied emotions that are coming up from this situation. And mm. it's just really intelligently and emotively done. It's wonderful. The other kind of groundbreaking thing I found about the film was the fact that she's living a very happy, loving life as a trans woman until this tragedy happens. So it's not about watching someone come to grips with who they are. It's about someone asserting who they are, which I think is a much more powerful image to present. It's similar, I think, from talking to Brent about Tangerine. It's a similar thing to that of going, Mm. it's not showing these characters as going through this major emotional turmoil like Eddie Redmayne and the fucking Danish girl. It's more about showing- Why? Why? (laughs) Why would you bring (laughs) that up? (laughs) Because what we see in A Fantastic Woman is somebody living their life. Sling tra- yeah. someone trying to live their life, not going through the usual queer film tropes of the grueling process of self-discovery. Yeah, and it's very playful with how it deals with it. It has one of the most fantastic images to do with trans identity or just queer identity in general oh. that I've ever seen on cinema. And it's breathtaking when it comes up. Is it the one which is walking down the street? No, I'm thinking of the bath. Oh, yes. Mm. Yes. It's yes. incredibly simple. And it's also just beautifully made. It looks gorgeous. The score is great. And the camera mm-hmm. fucking loves mm-hmm. Daniela Vega. Like, they just loves her. And you do. And that's kind of the most brilliant and breathtaking thing about it is just how magnificent she is and how the film just rallies entirely around her to make her look magnificent. Yeah, and she is groundbreaking because yeah. she is about to be the first openly transgender woman to present at the Oscars. It was just announced the other day she should have been nominated for an oscar oh, uh, for, best actress for that question you must please must go and find this film um, in its limited release you can find my full review at make and a fantastic woman is in cinemas now also out today is winchester the new paranormal thriller from the aussie spearig brothers Firearm heiress Sarah Winchester, played by Helen Mirren, is convinced that she is haunted by the souls killed at the hands of the Winchester repeating rifle. After the sudden deaths of her husband and child, she throws herself into the 24 hours a day, seven days a week construction of an enormous mansion designed to keep the evil spirits at bay. But when skeptical San Francisco psychiatrist Eric Price, Jason Clark, is dispatched to the estate to evaluate her state of mind, he discovers that her obsession may not be so insane after all. Mrs. Winchester, it's a pleasure to finally meet you. Do you believe in ghosts, Dr. Price? I do not believe in anything I cannot see or study. I feel their presence in the air, in the wall. It has found us. Mrs. Winchester, why all the construction? The spirits killed by the rifle. We lock them away. Thirteen nails seals them in. I will do whatever it takes to protect my family. 
This spirit has a power we've not seen before. You leave my family alone. Your anger will never defeat us. The film, shot on location in Victoria, also stars Australian gem Sarah Snook, love her, and while it might be Helen Mirren's first foray into the horror genre, it seems the scariest thing about this film might be its supremely negative critical and audience reception. Jinkies! Thanks, Velma. You welks. <laughs> yeah, you kind of see that coming with this. I actually did really kind of want to see this just for the shits and giggles of it. It's the really tricky thing with ghost films that it's one of those things where at their best, they can be extraordinary and fucking deeply terrifying. Isn't this based on a true story? Kind of. It's kind of vaguely yeah. based on a true story. Like Sarah Winchester did live in an enormous mansion and apparently she was a bit of a kook. But apart from that, part of me listens to the plot synopsis and goes, that's kind of a cool idea, but also... It's kind of a really dumb idea. A woman gets haunted by the souls of people killed by her husband's firearms that he invented. It's a very Spirit Brothers concept. But do you want a scary question? Try us. What was the last film starring Helen Mirren that was actually good? Oh. Ooh. Give me a moment. Yeah. yeah. Seriously, kids? Oh. It's rough. Maybe Red. Uh, I said good, Charlie. I didn't like red. I didn't hate the woman in gold. I was entertained. Uh, I liked Trumbo. She didn't have a huge role in it, but I liked Trumbo. Eye in the Sky is supposed to be quite good. I really yeah, enjoyed no, The Hundred Foot Journey, even though it was- You a- really liked that, didn't you? I yeah. did. The last genuinely great film- I didn't even like Monsters Universe. I'd it? say maybe The Last Station was maybe the last one I genuinely thought was impressive, but that was 2009. I might say Gosford Park. Whoa. Oh, Jesus, mate. <laughs> yeah. Pre-birth for Chris. No calendar girls. Well, regardless, from the early trailers, looked like a cheap horror film, but I was kind of hoping it was going to be a bit of fun, but it sounds like fun is not what it is. No, it does not. And also out today is 222. Jake caught this one and filed this review for us. Filmed in Australia by director Paul Curry, 222 centers on Dylan, Mikkel Huseman, an air traffic controller who notices the patterns in life. Each day on his way to work at JFK Airport, he notes different people doing the same thing in the same order. His life is rocked when he narrowly escapes being involved in a mid-air collision between two passenger planes, caused by mysterious blinding light that happens at 222 p.m. These strange occurrences continue and lead Dylan to meet Sarah, played by Teresa Palmer, with whom he feels a mysterious connection. This in turn disturbs her wanker ex-boyfriend, hologram artist Jonas, played by Sam Reed. Dylan and Sarah discover weird similarities with their current situation and a double murder committed a generation ago. With a grisly fate looming, a possible reenactment of a 30-year-old murder scene in Grand Central Station, Dylan must solve the mystery of 222 to preserve what seems to be his second chance at love. (sighs) <sighs> the other day at work, something happened. That was my flight. I nearly killed 900 people. No. You saved me. I know we only just met, but doesn't it feel like we've known each other forever? Can't stop smiling from ear to ear. <laughs> That's the third day in a row. gonna sound ridiculous. I keep seeing the same people. It's all part of some kind of pattern. What's really going on? Things are happening to me that cannot possibly be explained. Exactly 222. Boom. I've got to be honest. Teresa Palmer is a complete babe with some serious dramatic chops which she's rarely allowed to show. Watch Kate Shortland's Berlin Syndrome if you don't believe me. She's the best thing about a lot of shitty movies. 222 gives her a particularly thankless role. As crafted by screenwriters Todd Stein and Nathan Parker, 222 has a certain fart-sniffing pretentiousness about its script, liberally peppered with pseudo-metaphysical crap and a lot of contrivances. While it aspires to be a mind-bending tale about time and intransigence, the movie itself doesn't have the creative drive to be anything more than a tepid mystery with a few dumb twists and turns. There are some really good time-loop thrillers around. Stuff like Christopher Smith's Triangle, Duncan Jones' Source Code, Tony Elliott's Ark on Netflix, 
and Nacho Vigalondo's Time Crimes. 222 isn't nearly as brainy as it believes itself to be, and Dali needed stronger writing, editing, casting, you name it, to give the film the impact needed in order for the conceptual and the philosophical to be transformed into something even a little bit captivating. One star. 222 is in cinemas now, and you can find my full review at maketheswitch.com.au. Also out today is The Barbecue. Darren Dazza Cook, Shane Jacobson, is a lovable suburban everyman with a long-established belief that his family is related to Captain James Cook. Dazza harbors, <laughs> harbors a passion for barbecuing, but when he accidentally gives his neighbours food poisoning at his popular regular Saturday barbecue, Dazza's reputation and dignity are on the line. To make amends, he seeks tutelage from the tyrannical Scottish chef known simply as The Butcher, played by Magda Zabanski. Together they enter an international barbecue competition pitting Dazza's homespun recipes against the world's best barbecue chefs. I have to do this training course for a barbecue competition. What about the kids? Get out of my kitchen! If we're going to beat Andre Montblanc, you're going to need to lift your game. No more of this crappity backyard dozzy bollocks. That barbecue has been in my family for hundreds of years. Not letting me use that barbecue would be like, I don't know, taking the bat off Bradman. Number seven, Darren Dazza Cook, a non-professional chef, and the only one solely cooking on a backyard barbecue. The barbecue. Grill it, and they will come. So you can take your fancy smoker, and if it doesn't fit, it. Time for you the air yard. It's the first of two films in as many months to star Shane Jacobson involving a barbecue. Hashtag trendy. This simple yet entertaining story is sure to showcase this Aussie icon, the barbecue, not Shane Jacobson, in all its glory. Oh, dear Lord. I <laughs> hate everything <laughs> from the description of this film. But I think I hate more so that Manu from, is he on uh, My Kitchen Rules? Yeah. Uh, is one of the top build cast. What about Magda Zabanski? What is she doing? Uh, look, I, I don't better know. Than this. But I mean, what is this film doing? I mean, we like there's this thing where people talk about how they don't like Australian films. That's because really this is, there are either two kinds of Australian films. So art house that most general audiences aren't going to connect with it, or so dumb that most general audiences feel spoken down to. Embarrassed. This is kind of, I think, one of those. At least the exciting thing about the art house Australian films is that there is a certain degree of skill and care and attention paid to them, that they have potential to be something significant or to promote the great work of great artists in this country. And then there's the barbecue. (laughs) He thinks he's descended from James fucking cook it looks like it's yeah. basically pandering to the to the fucking lowest common denominator even more so but the fact i just looked up the trivia on uh, imdb and there actually is some trivia on here when mentioning families and their histories and their great stories they mention the kerrigans referring to the family in the castle and they live just down the road it's trying to be a fucking cinematic universe with the castle of all fucking films oh. Like, well, how can you expect audiences to support, support Australian films when this is the this is what the money is being spent on? Like, yes, we don't have our Muriel's Weddings anymore or our Strictly Ballrooms or all of those great so 90s classics or our Priscilla Queen of the Deserts. We have shit like this. Well, on the upside, I don't think much money has been spent on it. If you've dared to endure the approximately two minutes worth of trailer, Shane Jacobson looks like he doesn't want to be anywhere near this film as much as all of us. Um, Magda Zabanski has the most atrocious mm. Scottish accent, and it just it looks like it's been cut in iMovie and has been made in someone's home, not that this is actually something that should be released theatrically. So, yeah. But I'm sure it'll get a giant ad campaign and it'll be pushed to the night as they do with films like this. All right, now let's check out the upcoming films in our trailer wrap. Here's the teaser trailer for Incredibles 2. Help me bring supers back into the sunlight. We need Elastigirl. Bye, sweetie. I'll watch the kids, no problem. That's not the way you're supposed to do it, Dad. They want us to do it this I don't way. know that way. Why would they change math? Ah, math is math. Okay, math Dad. is math. I couldn't have done this if you hadn't taken over so well. I've got to succeed so she can succeed. Oh, there is 
so we can succeed. I get it, Bob. What the? That is freaky. But I can't keep giving him cookies. How? Oh, he's freaky. Nobody in a daddy. What? Done properly, parenting is a heroic act. Done properly. <laughs> There's nothing really to say, really, is there? Except just to be so fucking excited, your eyeballs are bleeding. Finally! Like, of all the films <laughs> where anyone ever wanted a sequel to, it's very high on the list. The fact that we're getting it is so fucking exciting. The fact that Brad Bird is writing and directing it is, again, is so fucking exciting. The fact that Michael yeah. Giacchino is following up with what probably is his greatest score by once again composing the music for this film. The fact that you've got all the original cast and it's mostly focusing by the looks of it on Holly Hunter's character on Elastigirl is a fucking dream. And Paul, my fiance, is very pleased that it starts a few minutes after the end of the previous film because he really wants to know what happens with the Mole Man guy. Like it's all the he's been talking Underminer. about. Yes, yeah, that one. Yes, that this one. Is a, this is a superhero movie, and yet it's taken 14 years to have a sequel. We've had three different incarnations of Spider-Man in 14 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this one is just like It's fast. like, this is possibly the greatest superhero film of all time. This is possibly one of the greatest action films of all time. Mm. And it's taken this long to get a fucking yeah. sequel to it's it. It's so long they've had to replace the actor who plays Dash because he's now an adult. We still have Holly Hunter and Craig T. Nelson and yeah. Samuel L. Jackson yes. and Brad Bird is back as Edna. And yes. it's got it's added Bob Edna Odenkirk Lord. and Catherine Keener <laughs> and <laughs> Isabel Rossellini. Yeah. Like it's just... It oh looks, it looks, it looks amazing. Oh, oh my god! I hope this movie has more Edna mode because oh. she was the best. I was so happy when Edna popped up in the trailer. So good. Edna mode. Okay, I will fix the whole boss suit. It's also just so interesting to see the levels of technical advancement that have happened over the past fourteen years, and to see these characters in these environments with so much more texture and detail, and just watching the leaps and bounds in animation in those years is so interesting, particularly in this context. In the fourteen since the last one Brad Bird has I mean there was Tomorrowland was a bit of a blip but he's Ugh. done like you know Ratatouille was fantastic and mm. his, his Mission Impossible film is I think still the best of the Mission Impossible films whoa 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 I mean yeah GoPro is pretty great but like let's not miss on Rogue Nation or on MI3 he, he Thank directed you very Rogue much. Nation didn't he or was Rogue Nation the last one no he didn't no, Christopher McQuarrie. He did Ghost Protocol. GoPro. Ghost Protocol is my favorite. I love Ghost Protocol. I thought it was fun. Or as Chris and only Chris calls it, GoPro. GoPro. There's just no wrong answer to which is the best Mission Impossible film, unless you're saying MI2. Because it's just the best MI2. franchise yeah, say, in existence. Yeah. Like... I'm totally here for Mission Impossible Love and Brad Bird's fantastic, so I'm really excited for Incredibles 2, brought it back around. Yeah, very good, very good, but yeah. Can I just interject and say one good thing came out of Mission Impossible 2, that because of that film, Doug Ray Scott was not able to play Logan in X-Men and we ended up with Hugh Jackman. Boom. Oh, that, that is a blessing. I know. That is one of those, yeah, like serendipitous moments. What would have happened to Hugh Jackman's pecs if not for Mission Impossible? They probably wouldn't have got so obnoxiously large. <laughs> um, Once you get to Hugh Jackman's pecs, there's just nowhere else to go, is there? We're excited. We're excited about this film. You should be excited about this film. Yeah. Everyone's excited about this film. Daniel is more excited about Incredibles 2 than Hugh Jackman's pecs. Which is really saying something. That sure is saying okay. something. You all will be too when it hits Australian cinemas on the 14th of June. All right, now let's take a look at the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society. Dear Miss Ashton, my name is Dorsey Adams. I am part of a book club, the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society, founded by Elizabeth McKenna. Our <laughs> Friday night book club became a refuge to us during the occupation by the Germans. People had to actually live with their enemy. Finally, I'll have something serious to write. A real writer. I want to see us. We we're expecting you. So happy to make your acquaintance. Mr. Adams, I've yet to meet him. You've conjured him. Um, hello. Hello. I'd like very much to write about you. The society. <laughs> And your founder, Elizabeth McKenna? I'm so looking forward to meeting her. You won't be meeting her. 
There's more to that story than they like to let on. What happened? It's not my story to tell. They don't want me writing about them. The war's not over for them. Not really. Elizabeth couldn't help but follow her heart. Shame on all of you! You must do the same. You have that courage. I've seen things I never thought could happen, happen. I lost people too. If you'd let me, I'd like to try and help. Hello, Jen. Okay, I just had to get that out of, my, out of my system because the magnificent Catherine Parkinson from the IT crowd is in this movie. Huzzah. Slash Doc Martin, but anyway. Hello, Jen. Also, same. Genuinely the thing I'm most excited about with this film. <laughs> oh, what a wonderful surprise to see her in it. Hello, Jen. Okay, the actual trailer aside for one second, I am going to complain about the title of this movie because what? no, it is it is stupidly it is stupid and it is long. <laughs> and yes, they mentioned that in the trailer, but I just want to say in the last couple months, uh, and especially in the lead up to the Oscars, whenever I have a conversation with people about like all the nominees and stuff like that, not once, once in like three months have I heard anyone say. Three billboards outside of Ebbing, Missouri, correctly. What I mean, the you fuck do you think is going to happen with well, I mean, this? You, you, you didn't. <laughs> what you, did I say? You didn't yeah, just yeah. then. So just... there's no oh, of okay. in it. Exactly. It's three That's what we're outside Ebbing, Missouri. What the fuck do you think people are going to do <laughs> with this title? I think people will get it right because people will, will remember the book, which was somehow a ginormous hit years ago. I've never heard of if it. If you find a little old lady in existence mm. who hasn't read the Guernsey Literary and Potato Pill Pie Society, <laughs> I will. <laughs> Eat a potato peel pie. My God. My 83 year old grandmother has definitely read this book. Mm hmm. Um, but, I mean, ridiculous yeah. title aside, I am all over this shit. Me too, because I've read the book and it's wonderful. Yeah. I Can we get that one more like time now? Newborn you babe. This might as well be Paddington too. I'm going to cry. Mike Newell, who directed this film, hasn't made necessarily made a, a great film in a while, but he's made some fucking great films. Like. Four Weddings and a Funeral. Uh, Four Weddings and a Funeral, Enchanted April, um, Donny Brasco. Uh, what else? Harry is Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Oh, oh, oh we know. Oh, we know. Oh, we know. Oh, Pipe down there. Oh. <laughs> but it, like, it, it's in pretty solid hands. And Lily James is just jumping from really great project to great project. And even in films that aren't necessarily great films like Darkest Hour, she shines in it. So it's been great to watch her grow and to be able to exert her acting muscles. Um, and it looks like this might give her a really good chance as well. I mean, Penelope Wilton, Tom Courtney, like this is a great cast and I'm very excited because it is a lovely story. Mikael Huisman in a film that looks interesting. What? As opposed to <laughs> 222. Say it ain't so. Like he walked on screen and I was pregnant. Oh, uh, okay. Um, Hello, Jen. Hello, Jen. <laughs> it may not be great, but it just looks like the best sort of comfort food. Mm. I'm very enthused. Yeah. Well, we could all take a bite of the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society when it hits Australian cinemas on the 19th of April. Not far to go at all now. All right, finally, let's take a look at the Breaker Upperers. Hello, Breaker Upperers. You want to be single by March? Consider it done. Just because we got gay marriage doesn't mean we need to follow through, you know? I didn't vote for it. You weren't gay eight months ago, Russell. I want a nice, clean break. I don't want years of heartache and stalking and therapy and possible violence. I will shoot your faces. You work for weak assholes who don't have the guts to talk to their partners. Yep. I'm Jen and this is Mel. Hey, Mel. Hi. Jordan, how can we help? I want to break up with the mom. This is Mrs. Cut him down! Put him on the ground! Mel. Mel. Oh, hell no! This better be Kane's at camera. That hasn't been a show since the 90s. I don't even know how you know that. <laughs> Do not talk to me, white girl. Huh? Okay, my suggestion is we walk away with our integrity and our faces intact. What do you say? She's pregnant. What the fuck? Just, just go with it. We did IVF because the eggs are a bit older. Now, when you suggested this trailer to be in this podcast as a point of discussion, I had not heard of this film. No, insisted. I had insisted. not heard of this film at all. And I was like, oh, what's this fucking bullshit going to be? But I'm and now, so excited. And now, this looks like such a delight. I laughed <laughs> during the trailer. Crazy concept. I laughed on the third time I watched the it. The two female leads are also the writers and the directors. Yay. 
Yay, I'm into baby. it. Produced mm-hmm. by Taika Waititi. I'm into it. Yep. Celia Pakuala's in it. I'm into it. I honestly could have stopped 30 seconds into this trailer. The first 30 seconds, I was like, I'm there. I'm there. I'm with this. I'm totally with this film. Yeah. Like, I don't have anything intelligent to say. I'm just, I really want to see this. It looks funny. It looks funny in a way that Australia, and so this is a New Zealand, if you didn't pick up from the trailer, this is a New Zealand film. Um, The the Kiwis seem to do comedy so much better than Australia has in such a long time. So I don't know, mate. Have you seen the barbecue? (laughs) (laughs) No, and neither has anybody else. Um, Plus, the kid from Boy has grown up to be a real babe. What? Which is really, <laughs> yeah. with, you know, I was like, that's a very handsome man. He's no boy anymore, that is. But also, oh. I was just reading up about James Rolleston, who was the kid in Boy who's now in this film. And actually, in his bio, it says, July 2016, he was in a life-changing mm. car crash, sustaining serious injuries, including brain trauma that was has affected his speech and other characteristics, but from which he continues to make recovery with the support of family and friends. So the fact that, like, wow. that's pretty, you know, he's a bit of an icon in New Zealand. He pops up in lots of major, you know, ad campaigns, like government ad campaigns. We know how great the government ad campaigns are in New Zealand. So, yeah, like, that's that's pretty damn impressive to be able to, you know, recover from an accident like that and still be able to be yeah, in major New Zealand combat, films. Yeah. But surely this has to write off the success of films like What We Do in the Shadows and uh, Hunt for the Wilder People in terms of the international awareness of New Zealand comedy. Well, you can catch The Break Robbers in Australian cinemas later this year. And for all those trailers and more, head to youtube.com forward slash make the switch AU. Earlier this week, the BAFTA Awards brought us to the final step before the Oscars, and the winners were quite predictable. In fact, in a lot of cases, they mirrored exactly what happened with the Golden Globes. So the winner for Best Film went to Through Awards outside Ebbing, Missouri, sure same did. as the Golden Globes. Yep. Uh, Best Actor was Gary Oldman. Best uh, Actress yep. was Frances McDormand. Best Supporting Actor, yep. Sam Rockwell. Best Supporting oh, Actress, Alison Jenny. It, and Best Director was Guillermo del Toro. It exactly mirrors exactly what happened at the Golden Globes. And I think there'd been a hope that that wasn't going to be the standard, but by the looks of it, that seems to be the way that it's going. Yeah, it's the fact that They're each people who normally I would be so excited to see get some sort of awards love, but it's just the wrong year for each of them. Like in each category, there is at least one, maybe two, sometimes three more deserving nominees and people who I would be equally happy to see any year get some sort of awards love. The nominations originally themselves were quite a surprise in that there were like uh, Get Out and Lady Bird did not feature as strongly as everyone was expecting in the nominations. Well, particularly Get Out got zero nominations. Yeah, it it didn't get a lot of recognition though. Daniel Kaluuya did win the BAFTA Rising Star Award, which was a very hotly contested set of actors because all of them were incredible and did great work this year. So it was quite nice to see him. Hey, Daniel, remember that? time we were talking about who might win that award and you said one person Jess said another person and then I said Daniel Kaluuya <laughs> and you're correct very good thank you thank you uh, and but there was there were some lovely surprises uh, adapted screenplay went to call me by your name which is just after it won the writers guild award so that looks like it's a pretty strong content to win the oscar which means that call me by your name will most likely walk away with an oscar indeed uh, cinematography went to Roger Deakins so hopefully that puts him in good stead and the Breakout British Artist Award was also really wonderful. It went to the writer, director, and producer team for I Am Little Witch. And one that I was very happy about was the Handmaiden Park Chan Wook's <laughs> film, um, one film not in English language, which was wonderful. But this brings us to probably, I think, the most contentious part of the awards, which was that three billboards episode in Missouri not only won Best Film, but also won the category for Outstanding British Film. What's interesting about that, of course, is that Three Billboards uh, is not set in Britain, does not have a British cast, and is not about Britain. The director is British, obviously, Mark McDonough, and the producing team is, but does that qualify it to be counted as a British film, particularly when you have films like Darkest Hour and God's Own Country and Lady Macbeth and Paddington 2 in contention for that award? To be honest, I'm not super hung up on whether it's a British film or not and what that means for, like, category classifications. To me, it just says volumes about the film itself. Not to beat a dead horse or a dead deer or an alive CGI deer, but 
Three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. The fact that it can win a category called Best British Film. I mean, the the thing that was so shocking about the BAFTA nominations originally was how few British films were represented. Of course, there was lots of outcry online about God's Own Country being cut out of a lot of awards, but also uh, Lady Macbeth not being recognised. There were a lot of really great British films in the past year, some really standout ones. The only one that seems to sneak through in some of the categories was film stars Don't Die in Liverpool. Pool. Deservedly so. Yeah, it was quite a controversial nomination. So I, this feels like it's instead with whether or not the British Film Awards actually represent British cinema. But I have hope. I'm like Obama in 2008. I've got hope, kids. I think that because everything's firmed up so surely in these few weeks and every single performance category, the directing category, the screenplay categories seem to have shored up so much, I think this is going to be a very surprising Oscars. At least that's what I'm telling myself every night before I go to bed. So we have just under two weeks until the Oscars finally get announced. Is it going to be a big surprise or is it going to repeat itself I guess you'll just have to wait and see. And we'll be here on Switch to report all about it. Now, just in case you hadn't had enough of us incessantly screeching about random Oscar paraphernalia, get wrecked. Here comes some more. <laughs> a recent IndieWire article delved into the greatest films of the 21st century that somehow missed out on a single Oscar nomination in their respective years. So, with the 90th Academy Awards getting closer and closer, we thought it'd be a fine time to talk about our favourite films and their most infuriating misses. And and, you know, why the heck not? Let's open it up to the entirety of history. So, <laughs> Jess, what do you say? I've got a list, actually, but I'm going to pick one from most recent history because it actually segues beautifully from what we were just talking about in the trailers. Hunt for the Wilder People. Yeah. I am so hmm. disgustingly obsessed with this film and Taika Waititi. I think he's so fantastic. I, I don't care what it would have been nominated for. Picture, screenplay. I think screenplay would have been its best bet. But this film was fantastic and it killed me that it didn't get enough international recognition. I have to admit, I did kind of expect it might get a screenplay nomination. In any in any yeah. awards, like not just the Oscars, just at all. It was actually quite a surprise how absent it was. And it wasn't like it wasn't in the mainstream. It was so insanely successful in New Zealand and in Australia. And um, I'm not sure how it did it anywhere else in the world. But so like it was out there, like it was it was in the ether. People should have known about it. I don't think it did particularly big business in the US. I, worldwide, like it's full. It's an, I know, I know. Look, I can't understand it either, but I just I don't think it got the same release as it did here and maybe that's something that people go and revisit after Thor Ragnarok but yeah even in the US it seems to have only made around five million dollars which comparatively to even an American indie release is nothing yeah um, another one on my list is a film from 2013 uh, called Short Term 12. Oh. It was a little indie that starred Brie Larson. It is exquisite. It's an exquisite independent film. I seriously thought she should have been nominated for Best Actress, but luckily she ended up turning that around and winning two years later for Room, equally as deserving. But Short Term 12, like the film as a whole, but Brie in particular, didn't get enough attention for me. 100% agree. I don't think Brie Larson full stop gets yeah, enough attention true, true. but anyway for me the one thing from that film that i just had no idea how people weren't picking up on it was keith stanfield i would have given him the award for sporting actor that year he was so fantastic and he has this highlight scene about halfway through where he delivers this rap that is one of the most gut-wrenching moments in cinema of recent years no hyperbole promise <laughs> <laughs> never on this podcast no literally never yeah I've got like a very large list and a lot of them are for screenplays. Like I've mentioned on the podcast before, I love dialogue. I love screenplays. They're the, it's the thing that attracts me most to a film. And so a couple here, I've got maybe 500 Days of Summer screenplay wise, Lars and the Real Girl. And one of my favorite films of all time, Stranger Than Fiction. Did that not get a nomination? <gasps> Yes. I thought that was a fantastic screenplay and I don't, I, I still to this day, I do not understand why it wasn't nominated. He brought her flowers. He did bring like, her come flowers. Like, F-L-O-U-R-S. So, of course, that should have got yeah, a mask. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yes. It, got, it got Golden Globe recognition. It didn't get Oscar love and, oh, it just breaks my heart. Well, I, I can think of a lot of classic films that probably deserve to at least get a nomination, but did not even get a look in. A couple of really quintessential films, in fact, 
Reservoir Dogs, I think, is one of the more recent ones that I would say. I It's probably one of my favorite Quentin Tarantino films. I'm less of a fan of his later things. But uh, that, that to me, I, I love the writing in that. Um, the Shining never got noticed for an Oscar. Going back to as far as things like King Kong and Frankenstein, neither of those films, which are absolute classics of the monster genre now, None of those got recognized by the Academy. Um, and Scarface. Scarface missed out on uh, on any kind of uh, Oscars nomination as well. The biggest one I had th- for me it was actually the number one on um, IndieWire's list. Uh, and it still uh, befuddles me to this mm-hmm. day why and how that film slipped under. Because it wasn't just that it wasn't nominated for any Oscars. It was barely nominated for any awards that award season. And that's Zodiac. Yep. <laughs> like now the general critical consensus on David Fincher's filmography is that Zodiac is his greatest film and is one of the greatest films of the 21st century. But the fact that it didn't get a single Oscar nomination for its direction, its editing, its performances, that it didn't get a single one is, I still just, I mean, it was a particularly packed year that year. I mean, that was the same year as films like Assassination of Jesse James and There Will Be Blood and No Country for Old Men. It was a particularly great year for that style of American cinema. But that's the big one for me, Zodiac. I still don't understand how it didn't get nominated for anything. Well, I thought I'd keep things up to date and up to the minute by focusing on this year's Oscar nominations and the films that didn't get anything, any recognition at all this year. And I'm just going to rapid fire them, you know, just rapid fire. We've been going on for a bit long. Who cares? Um, So first up, BPM, the French submission for foreign language film this year is a wonderful AIDS drama that is just so fantastic and specific and kind of interesting in its textures and the way that it is just about gay LGBTIQ plus people arguing with each other. It's so fantastic. Um, the Beguiled, Sphere Coppola's hilarious oh, comedy, yeah. uh, which, that you was, know, oh. Kirsten Dunst, where's her nomination? Yeah. The cinematography, where is it? Actually, Kirsten Dunst pops up a lot. Exactly. Kirsten Dunst, where is her Oscar? Come on, people. Melancholia. Melancholia. Where was it? Where was it? Where was Kirsten. it? Was Personal Dunst. Shopper. Kristen Stewart's performance is one of, like, the most interesting female mm. performances of the past few years. <laughs> Good time. Robert Pattinson right there with her. Stop naming! Twilight people. Lady Macbeth, Florence Pugh, come on. Mother, Jennifer Lawrence. Mother. And that fantastic cinematographer and sound design. Sound design nomination. Oh, mother, where art thou? Most of all, and I know this is going to unanimously go down well on this podcast, The Lost City of Zed. (laughs) Yeah. Put it in for picture, put it in for director, put it in for lead actor, put it in for supporting actress, cinematography, sound design, everything. Because that That film is fantastic. (laughs) What I wouldn't give to replace the surprise nominations for Darkest Hour for The Lost City of Zed. Like... Just, or just, just like so the disaster cool. artist in a that would, that would involve Come anyone on. having to have watched it in oh, the first place. Oh, it's magnificent! So. It is. I watched it twice. It's, it's, it's a worlds magnificent away. film. It's extraordinary. I'm with Chris. If you it's enjoy putting yourself to sleep. All right, all right. So there you go. If you go through the Oscar nomination lists looking for great films, but you don't always find great films, there's some that you weren't going to see on there. Don't always get it right. And if you've got any suggestions, we want to hear from you. Come on. Let us know. Find some films that didn't get Oscar nominations and tell us on Facebook, on Twitter, on any of the litany of social medias that we are on. We want to hear from you. League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. (laughs) Shut up, Brent. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay, switching gears. In 1971, audiences were invited to view Paradise with Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, the first big screen adaptation of the Roald Dahl classic. It was a box office flop, but found its place in our hearts, home movie collections and pure imaginations in the decades that followed. Then in 2005, Tim Burton and Johnny Depp in an Anna Wintour wig gave kids a chance to score a golden ticket <laughs> once again. It was the remake no one wanted or asked for. It made millions, but not the culture impact of its predecessor. Now in 2018, a third adaptation is in the works, this time helmed by Paddington 2 director Paul King. So, what do we all think? It has been 13 years since we visited the Oompa Loompas. Before we get on our fucking nostalgia ruin my childhood <laughs> high horse, which I myself am very guilty of getting on very many, many, many times, <laughs> particularly about films about board games that take you to the jungle. 
Um, <laughs> so many so that the horse is now dead. But anyway. Yes, but this isn't remaking Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. They've been talking about this film for a while. It's a project about the early adventures of Willy Wonka. So stuff that happens that he talks about in the book, it's prior to that. So technically we're not getting another Charlie goes to the Chocolate Factory and Augustus gets stuck in a pipe thing. I think that there's a great potential in it. I wouldn't have thought to Dickens about it until Paul King was attached to it because I've only seen Paddington. I haven't seen Paddington 2. But Paddington is so fucking wonderful (laughs) that I would just happily see anything he does. It's also an opportunity for this character to actually be given to a British team because so often Roald Dahl's works are not adapted by British film and it loses something in the translation. That's the thing I don't like about Fantastic Mr. Fox is it loses the Britishness and becomes just the Wes Anderson obnoxiousness. Mm, That's so interesting, Daniel, because that's the thing I don't like about you. Oh, that's, uh, I, I've ad- I have that out of Britishness. I grew up reading Roald Dahl books. I grew up reading all of those books. I really enjoyed them. But the thing that I always find disappointing when watching those films translated onto the big screen is that they lose the Britishness. So knowing that there's a person behind the project who has an understanding of what makes the children's literature so special and has done with um, the Paddington stories, the fact that he'll be doing that to Roald Dahl, I think is really exciting. Just the fact that someone with wit will have a chance to adapt a Roald Dahl product. Like, I'm sorry, but Tim Burton, nah. Steven Spielberg, love him. Not the wittiest guy alive. (laughs) This is pretty exciting to me. I'm about this. Mm. We don't know a huge amount about this. We, in fact, don't even necessarily know if Paul King is actually going to be. He's just at the moment in talks to direct. I don't even know if we know who's writing this particular piece. Uh, Simon Rich, who wrote oh. The Secret Life of Pets. Oh. oh, there we go. Which was okay. <laughs> it wasn't the worst. Yeah, I take back my earlier excitement. Now I've got a little bit of side eye. <laughs> but hey, maybe Paul King will take over some writing duties once he gets on board. So true. Project. I love an optimistic spirit. Thank you, Daniel. That would be Thank super you. nice. But there is a lot to be said about nostalgia too. I don't think it's just about the British part of these stories either. I think it's also something to do with the fact that a lot of time has passed since we read a lot of Roald Dahl stories. And... I think when they're tackled in a more modern world, like I feel that Charlie and the Chocolate Factory was, it kind of loses some of that magic. I think that's one of the real advantages of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Let's not forget, this film isn't being made for us. This film, like, it's been a long time since we read Roald Dahl, but Roald Dahl is still read a lot by children. He's still one of the most popular children's authors in the world. So as much as we... But I wouldn't necessarily say that that the film is not being made for us. If the film is not being made for us, then it's kind of defeating the whole Paddington idea. Okay, so Oompa Loompa Dumpity do we now want to hear from you! (laughs) Hit us up up on social media because we we love to hear what you think. (laughs) I can't deal with this (laughs) Anymore. We'd no. love to hear what you have to think about this stuff. What do you think about this topic? Hello, 911. I'd like to report a matter. <laughs> so, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. <laughs> Let us have it. We have some great giveaways up for grabs this week. And first up, we're giving away five copies. Guys, stop laughing. This is serious Very business. Serious. We're giving away five copies of Nikolai Costawaldo's Shot Caller this week. Jacob is a successful businessman who, after killing a man in a DUI car accident, is sent to a maximum security prison where he soon realises he must adapt or die. We're also giving you the chance to win one of five Blu-ray copies of Goodbye Christopher Robin this week. At the end of the First World War, beloved children's author A.A. A. Milne, played by Donald Gleeson, creates the magical world of Winnie the Pooh. But the book's international success comes at a cost to the author, his young son Christopher Robin, Will Tilston, and his wife Daphne, Margot Robbie. We also have five copies of Catherine Bigelow's Detroit up for grabs on Blu-ray this week. In the summer of 1967, Detroit's African-American population was at the mercy of a predominantly white police force and discrimination in every aspect of their lives. The community was at breaking point, and a routine police raid on an unlicensed bar became the trigger for a citywide riot. 
Detroit erupted into one of the largest citizen uprisings in US history. The Square is heading to cinemas soon and we're giving you the chance to win a double pass to see this Oscar-nominated film for yourself. Christian is the respected curator of a contemporary art museum. His next show is The Square, an installation which invites altruism from passers-by. But sometimes it is difficult to live up to your own ideals. Christian's foolish response to a theft of his phone drags him into shameful situations. And to celebrate this year's Alliance Francaise French Film Festival, we have 10 double passes up for grabs. Running in seven cities and two satellite locations across Australia in 2018, witness the best of French cinema with over 50 features and documentaries, many of which will be Australian premieres. Last but by no means least comes this mammoth challenge. We want you to pick this year's Oscar winners. It's not easy, but the payoff is great. Whoever gets the most correct will score a massive prize pack from Switch. We're not making it easy though. You have to share your predictions in every single category this year. So use your film knowledge for your chance to win now. And for your chance to win this and all our great prizes, head to make the switch.com.au forward slash comps now. And before we go, we'd like to offer you some cinematic inspiration with each of us suggesting one film that you should see this week and why. For me, I'm continuing on my Oscar Best Picture films. I'm going to 1965 to the absolute classic, The Sound of Music. I knew you were going to say that. I just had this feeling. I was like, he's going to say The Sound of Music. I concur. It's wonderful. Please continue. Are you a gay? I'm a part-time gay, yeah. Oh, wow. Just Friday through to Sunday. I, I think it's actually more like five out of seven days of the week. But anyway, God, what does that have to do with the sound of music? Anyway. Everything. <laughs> everything. Everything has to do with the sound of music because the sound of music is a fucking wonderful film. Anyway, in a modern world, this sounds like an absolutely ludicrous storyline. A woman has to go from a convent and go into hiding as the governess of a rather wealthy family. And basically she ends up changing all of their lives through the medium of music. Into hiding? What is she hiding from? Music. She's hiding going to God? hide. God? <laughs> she goes into soul searching. God is always watching. <laughs> she gets fucking kicked out because she keeps going around on mountaintops and spinning around like a fucking bell and sing. What is it you can't face? Been there, bitch. <laughs> How do you solve a problem like Maria? Ship her off to someone else's fucking problem. <laughs> uh, okay, it's true. But it does have one of those absolutely defining roles of Julie Andrews, possibly only matched in a musical by, say, Mary Poppins. And it's such an endearing musical. Like, the legacy of the songs in this movie are just unlike practically any other musical in history. It's also just exceptionally well directed. Like, it's like the direction and the cinematography and the editing is just so fucking exceptional. Oh, yeah. The cinematography in that film, each time I rewatch it, which for some reason has been quite a few times recently, <laughs> and I'm not even that huge a fan, but it looks yeah. incredible. Some of those Austrian... Austrian. <laughs> Austrian. I can't even remember what I was saying. <laughs> Well, on top of Best Picture, it did also win Best Director and Best Film Editing, along with Best Sound. It also won Best Music Scoring of Music Adaptation or Treatment, which was clearly not a category that's still in existence today. But <laughs> they don't make fucking musicals <laughs> anymore like that. Exactly. <laughs> no, exactly. Oh, so, R.I.P. in oh, peace. So, yeah, five-time Oscar winner, The Sound of Music. If you have not seen it on the big screen slash small screen, it is your job this week to go and do so. Put aside a good four hours. Yeah. <laughs> you, you'll, need, you'll need a good Put aside day. four days of your life. Watch the sound of music. <laughs> but if you haven't yet, also shame on you. Like, what is wrong yeah. with your life? So Where the hell, where the fuck have you been? <laughs> like, seriously, there are sing-along screenings at least once, once or twice a year. So yeah. anyway, that is mm. me. Jess, what are you suggesting for us this week? Throwback to a previous segment. I am recommending one of my all-time favorite movies. If you don't believe me, go to the About page on maketheswitch.com.au. It is actually listed in my profile. I'm going with 2006's Stranger Than Fiction. Oh. It is one of the most beautiful 
magic realism films yeah. ever. It is about an IRS agent, Harold Crick, played by Will Ferrell in one of the most like non-Will Ferrelly roles ever. Anyway, he starts hearing his life being narrated and he can't figure out why, if it's real or if he's crazy. Um, so he tries to track down what it's all about and he employs the help of Dustin Hoffman and he meets um, a woman played by the magnificent Maggie Gyllenhaal who plays a baker and so he sort of falls in love and he discovers new things about his life while he's trying to track down this narrator who is actually played by Emma Thompson who is a novelist struggling with writer's block it's very late it's very complicated it is an exquisite film it is just the embodiment of beauty when it comes to love and fiction and life and comedy and tragedy and it's just oh this movie makes me so happy and I love it yeah stranger than fiction go see it it's pretty fucking great. It is. it is great. As someone currently studying a writing course, it really inspired me back in the day and really got me onto the idea that screenwriting and writing is a huge possibility and something that can be really wonderful and beautiful. Yay. I don't have any jokes to make about this film. <laughs> like, it's it's great and genuinely inspired me as a young man. What? We've broken Chris. My God. You know you're in for a good film when Chris is being dead serious about it. So. (laughs) Exactly. Good suggestion, Jess. And Daniel, your turn. What's on the cards this week? Well, in honour of Jess returning to the podcast this week, I'm going to choose a a piece of 80s nostalgia from my childhood. Yeah. Um, It's a weird film. I don't even necessarily think it's a good film, but I just adore it. And I rewatched it yesterday because I finally tracked down a Blu-ray copy, which is very hard to get. And that is Walter Murch's 1985 film, Return to Oz. So it hold, this film actually holds the record in the Guinness Book of Records for the longest a gap between a original film and its sequel. But this isn't really a sequel to The Wizard of Oz, as in the MGM Judy Garland masterpiece. It is Dorothy after what happens in that original story. Uh, and it's based on, the, on some of the later books. But it has a lot more of a darker, more textured feel to it. The basic premise is that Dorothy's having all these dreams about Oz and Arnie M and Uncle Henry decide to take her to a doctor to get her looked up and she's, they say, oh, we'll help her. And then they strap her to a bed and are about to give her electroshock therapy and experimental electroshock therapy and she's rescued and taken to Oz where she finds that Oz has become kind of a desolate wasteland and all of her friends have disappeared and the Emerald City has no emeralds and it's being overseen by this witch called Mumby who can change her heads. She has like corridors of heads behind these beautiful glass cabinets. So Dorothy, with a group of new friends, decides that the only way is to find the Scarecrow, and, the, and who's now the King of Oz, and and save everybody. Um, like, the performances are a bit weird, and the script isn't particularly great, and it's a bit of a mess, but the production design is fucking incredible. It sits much closer to W.W. W. Denslow's original illustrations for the, the Baum novels than it does to anything in the Judy Garland film. It's very dark, it's very weird, it's very un- it, it's got a fucking great score, and I just love it. In fact, I would actually almost say I think like obviously The Wizard of Oz is a masterpiece but the point of like going back to Willy Wonka there's never been another adaptation of the damn thing it's just that one like 70 80 year old film but for me this was my Oz growing up as a kid this is this was the image that I had of Oz so if you're in for something a bit off off the chain with some pretty fucking terrifying things for a children's film 1985 Disney film Return to Oz that's my recommendation for the week did anyone else watch this as a kid yeah Yeah, I I grew up with it too Uh, yeah it's it is like it's not really something that is particularly suitable for young children yeah. and but that was a different time Daniel yeah. it was a very <laughs> I just time. fucking loved it so that is Daniel's recommendation for the week Chris you are rounding up the podcast what have you got in store well about five minutes ago I was panicking because I thought I had to be like a boring normal person <laughs> and I was gonna pick an actual film. Uh, for my recommendation, <laughs> but oh shit! Please what? do I not tell me. Struck, and I figured out a way to once again cheat. And I genuinely think you're gonna be mad at me about this one. But anyway, I'm seriously probably gonna impale you on something. Yeah, I hope so, Daddy. Uh, so. Um, <laughs> So Don't anyway, cut it out. calm down, calm down, kids. Anyway, oh, I just threw up in my mouth a little bit. <laughs> Good. 
Like for years and years and years, ever since I really got into films, I've been really obsessed with cinematic like super edits on YouTube. And at the end of each year, these particular editors would make these super cuts of all of the films that came out that year and score it to a certain song or something. And it'd be fantastic. And I really loved it. And it would give me all these recommendations for films that came out that year that I missed that look amazing. And I sort of fell off the bandwagon a little bit for a while, but recently I got hugely into it again because of the work of David Ehrlich, who is a critic at IndieWire. And each year he compiles a list of his 25 favorite films of the year and edits them into this beautiful cinematic mashup. And that is really great. Uh, It's the top 25 films of 2017. David Ehrlich is the critic. Oh, it's beautiful. This year, and I think it's 2015 is fantastic. 2015 in particular. That's I'm going to say that's my recommendation. The top 25 films of 2015 from David Ehrlich. The ending in particular combines two of my favourite films of that year and one film that I've actually recommended recently on the podcast into this just fantastic kind of mashup that I never would have expected and didn't realise worked so well. And he's just really talented and they're really fantastic. They'll make you cry. Yeah. I cried at his last one. It was just like, oh, cinema. Cinema's fucking wonderful. Cinema's wonderful. But they're just so beautifully made in their own right. Like, they're not just taking, like, stealing things from other films. They're actually quite beautiful little pieces of art in their own right. And funny. So there you go. That's my recommendation, Charlie. Hi, Charlie. (laughs) How are you going? The fact that you cannot recommend any films makes me think you aren't actually watching any films. I'm probably watching more films than anyone on this podcast. Get off the fucking internet and go to the cinema. Love you. Well, three out of four ain't bad. Some fantastic suggestions in that recommendation list. And you can find the links to all the articles we've talked about on this week's podcast at maketheswitch.com.au. Please subscribe to Switchcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget to rate us. And stay in touch on Twitter. I'm at Charlie underscore David. Jess. At Miss Jess underscore Switch. Daniel. At Daniel Lemon And Chris. At Chris C. Edwards. Like it, follow it. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Make the Switch AU to stay up to date with all the latest reviews, news, trailers, and giveaways. And you can find all the notes and links to everything we've discussed on this week's podcast, as well as other episodes by visiting switchcast.com.au. On next week's show, I'll be reviewing another contender for Best Foreign Language Film at the Academy Awards, Ruben Oslin's darkly hilarious The Square. Plus, I'll be checking out Annette Benning and Jamie Bell in yet another film that left me a blubbering mess, Film Stars Don't Die in Liverpool. And we'll find out if Jennifer Lawrence and director Francis Lawrence can replicate the success of The Hunger Games in Red Sparrow. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you all next week. 